So um, welcome, yeah, if, if you're here. And again, we just gather, I mean, it's always the case, isn't it, that we gather with lots of different emotions, but uh, to Simon Middleton's family, to Ruth Graham's family, Anna Gibbs' family, and, and other losses that we may not even realise that you're here with and, and carrying with. And again, that's the sadness and the challenge of, of this season, isn't it? We don't always know what's going on. Um, but just, you know, special warm welcome to you on, on this day. Um, we gather with so much that we need to take to God. And as a, as a church family, we've been thinking about prayer. We've been following through this book, How to Pray. Probably one of the last times you'll ever hear us for a while at least say, grab a book if you haven't already got one from the back, from the, from the bookstore. Uh, and we're unashamed in doing prayer because uh, prayer is central to our relationship with, with God. I don't know what the quality of your prayers are. I like looking up sometimes when you can see um, kids' prayers. And I, I came across a, a, a couple here was one dear god i need you to stop my mum being allergic to cats i really want a cat and i really don't want my mum to have to move out <laughs> there was a, another one dear god please forgive me for hiding my brother's lego and dear god please don't tell my brother where his lego is <laughs> So this book, I can thoroughly, I can thoroughly recommend. It covers every kind of kind of prayer. Here's just a, a slide with a summary of just some of the key themes that that uh, Pete Gregg goes through. And I just just encourage, remind you very briefly. Talked about what it means to slow down and to centre in prayer. Um, then P and then R for rejoice and how thanksgiving and rejoicing. Um, you know how many of us are just in the in the reality of death. We're giving thanks. For every moment and every day, we just we can't take tomorrow for granted. Such a life we, we live, don't we? So many of us, sadly, in this world live for tomorrow. You know, when, if, you know, um, and we're just reminded. So thanksgiving, adoration and thanksgiving. And then asking A for ask, petition we were talking about, um, seeking God, asking God for things for ourselves. Intercession, praying for the world around and others. We talked about unanswered prayer. Hills did a, a session, uh, two talks last week on unanswered prayer. And you may notice from, from the newsletter that Hills is doing a seminar on unanswered prayer next Sunday at four in Trinity House. So if that's something you want to explore a bit further than Hills is doing that and then we're now we're on to this last letter why and Pete Greg uses this this word yield or as Tim uh, Benton was sharing a few weeks ago we might say our yes to God and that's where we are that's where we are to, today that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today but I recommend the recommend the book um, how much we need to need to pray Pete, uh, in, in the book, talks about this final step uh, in the dance of prayer as surrender. Talks about it having the, the dynamics of contemplation and listening, of confession, reconciliation, of forgiveness. And that's the thing I'm going to locate on. And then next week, we're going to be talking about the last bit that he talks about, which is, which is spiritual warfare. Here's, here's just a very brief summary of two of the bits. I'm going to touch on forgiveness after we have our act of remembrance in a couple of minutes' time. But here we go. Here's a quick summary. Contemplation, this first part of saying yes to God, praying without words. And if you want to read the book, Pete talks about three dynamics. Meditation, where perhaps we're focusing on our own lives, particularly contemplation, where we focus in on God. And then, and then actually coming to a place of communion, where we're lost in God, saturated in God. Mary at the foot of Jesus' feet whilst Martha is running around. And then the second dynamic that Pete goes into a lot of detail, I just keep, you know, watch the videos that are provided by him if you want to, read the book, listening. We started the whole of this series, Tim Grew started, you know, that prayer is God's gift to us in order to enable a conversation, in order to enable a relationship. And a relationship, a conversation involves speaking and listening. And in this yes part of prayer, in the surrender, the listening, and Pete talks about these five ways, 
listening through the Bible, through scripture, God speaking to us through his word, through dreams and visions, through counsel, other people's voices, through our own common sense, the Holy Spirit, God at work in us, giving us a sense of the rightness of things, through personal reflection and through, through action. So see the book for more on those things. But the one I want to focus in on is forgiveness, and it's right to do it on Remembrance Sunday, I think, to talk about forgiveness. In the Lord's Prayer, the hardest line of the Lord's Prayer Pete talks about, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Why is it hard? Because we just put it on the screen again, Cheryl, please. Our sin, it's just straight to the point. We have things that we need to ask God for forgiveness for. And that, and that clashes with our pride in, our, in ourselves. Why should I have to do that? And then as we forgive others who sin against us, we don't like thinking about having to ask others for forgiveness or forgiving others for wrong things. If you'd like to please stand, we're going to have just our act of remembrance simply. The clock is a minute fast if anyone's worried about it. I've got Greenwich Mean Time on my phone. This is a day when we remember in order to make a difference. We remember the sacrifice of others who've given their lives in war. We'll hear the last post played, then there's a two minute silence, and then there's the, the trumpet reveille or have you said. And this is a moment when we're remembering all those who've lost their lives in war. But as Christians, we're praying for God's kingdom to come. Head. <laughs> Thank you. 
Father God, we praise and thank you for your love for us, that everything about life is held in your hands. On this day, as we remember those who gave their todays for our tomorrows, and we remember those who continue to serve, as we remember the horror of war and conflict, we look to you. We look to you, God, for a proper and right understanding of all things. We look to you so that we will remember all those who've lost their lives in a way that makes a difference to the way that we live today. Let us honour the memory of those who've gone before by the way we live. We pray for world leaders we pray for all in authority around the world, all those who can influence for peace. We pray for peace across the world. Let your kingdom come. Amen. Do take a seat. Of course, I'm, I'm sorry for, in a sense, of squeezing some things in, but I, I deliberately wanted just to get us starting to thinking about this tough line, this tough topic of forgiveness, just before we did the act of remembrance, because I don't know about you, it's so easy, I find, just to kind of objectify or to push over. It was the throw the leopard of lying at somebody else or the leaks of whatever it was at somebody else. And it's, it's easy to make it about bigger things beyond myself. And it's easy to make these things about other people. And yet the cross is, is both the whole of eternity in perspective. It is the center event of the whole of eternity. But it's also personal. Christ died for us. And so this thing of forgiveness is about us personally. It's not something that is kind of done kind of by others on our behalf. This thing of remembrance on a Remembrance Sunday is, is about us personally. And there's a connectivity between the small things in my life and the bigger picture. So I can't pray for my government, my leaders, to exercise uh, reconciliation and peace and look at the world stage without thinking about, am I at peace with my neighbour? Because my lack of peace, if that's the case, with my neighbour, the person I work with tomorrow, the person across the desk or the person on the other end of the Zoom or the email, if I'm not at peace with them, if I am in dispute with them, if there is war between us, then that is connected to the lack of peace, to war, to all of the things that are so terrible in our world. And so this thing of forgiveness, which, as I say, Pete, in his excellent book, talks about as being the hardest line, is something that just feels right for us to focus on today and thinking about, thinking about remembrance someday. And even, yes, you know, in the question of death, of sudden death, of Ruth being torn away from us and Anna being torn away from us by the scourge of cancer, of, of Simon being killed in a car crash. I, I don't, by the way, use the language of passed away. I use the language of death and the language of torn and ripped because that's the right language for us to use so that we recognize the depth and so that we go to God with the whole of our feelings. We live in a society which has sanitised death. When I take funerals, quite often I'm, I'm kept away from the coffin. You're kept away from, from the coffin. There's a sort of slight sanitization of death that goes on. So it's why as ministers, when we do a prayer of commendation, and I've done it for one or two of you in this, in this room, members of your family, I, I try and touch the coffin because we need to know the reality of these things so that we can know the reality of God's love and comfort. The disciples 
didn't get it. The first followers of Jesus didn't get it. So straight after the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, we have this verse. Thank you, Cheryl. For if you forgive other people, Jesus reinforces having gone through the Lord's Prayer. says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. It, it's graphic. Later on in Matthew's gospel, as Matthew records Jesus' teaching and how Jesus um, you know, lived out and expressed to the first followers the implications of, of his teaching, we get to Matthew chapter 18 and Jesus is teaching on the, the practicalities, as I say, of Christian following. He, he deals, if you read Matthew 18, with pride and status questions. He, he deals with the consequences of if we cause somebody else to stumble and how serious that is is. He deals with the, the issue of wrong action within a church family, with sin being in a church family and not being called out and dealt with. And then Peter, and, and you can sort of sense that the, the disciples have been mulling this. Peter is so often, isn't he, the, the mouthpiece of the rest of the group of men and women who were the, the first followers of Jesus. Peter sort of kind of puts into words what others wanted to say. He's, he asked this question. Peter comes to him and says to him, Jesus, he's been mulling about this forgiveness thing. How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to, up to seven times. Now, it's important you know that seven in Hebrew thinking is perfection. That number seven represents completeness. It's associated with God's holiness. It's, it's, it's particularly the word complete. So, so, so Peter is saying, God, do I have to do this perfectly? And then look at what Jesus says. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 and the Greek is actually times seven times. Unlimited. The rabbis of Jesus' time, the Jewish teachers of his time, when they were asked this question, they said, well, you forgive up to three times. Forgive up to three times. Seventy times seven times, says Jesus. Unlimited is this thing of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a secondary consideration. Forgiveness is, is not a one-time action. Forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness really matters. That's why Pete, Greg in the book says that this yielding, this fourth dynamic of the dance, this fourth bit of the dance of prayer is the most important. Why? Well, we know, I'm sure, don't we? And here's a verse from, from the Psalms that forgiveness is the very nature of the God in whose image we are made. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Old Testament, first part of our Bibles, the God of the Old Testament, the first part of our Bibles is exactly the same God as Jesus in the New Testament. Whenever God's judgment is exercised in the Old Testament, it comes after centuries of warning of the consequences of defying God. There are always people spared. God's nature is forgiving. Mercy, he doesn't give us what we deserve. Grace, he gives to us what we don't deserve. Relationship. Provision, guidance, fullness of, of life. And we're reflecting today on the cross, which is where we, if we want to see where is God when we suffer? Where is God in war? Where is God in our pain? Where is God in the grief that we are sharing in as a family? Well, we look to the cross. Our God is not distant. Our God is not, is not absent. Our God is not unfeeling. Our God has stepped into the middle of the mess, the middle of the pain. And on the cross, 
Here's a verse from Ephesians. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. And the first words of Jesus on the cross, I'm sure many of us know, were, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. As so often in scripture, there's a kind of legal aspect to the language, to the original language here. There's this kind of uh, sense of a case being put. What's your, what's your case against people? What's your case against God? And Jesus is saying, Father, forgive them. There are extenuating circumstances. They don't know what they're doing. J. John, who's an evangelist that some of us know, someone who shares the good news of Jesus regularly, says, most of us struggle to pray for good people in good times. Here, Jesus prays for bad people at the worst of times. Jesus is living his teaching. I hope you know also, though, that forgiveness is crucial and critical to everything there is about us. It is the nature of God. And if we follow Jesus, if we say we're people of the cross, then this costly thing of forgiveness is crucial to our, our well-being. I hope you also know what Christian forgiveness actually involves, actually what it is. I find quite often that people don't know their understanding of forgiveness is bound up in the world's notions of forgiveness. Here's just a, a summary of things that forgiveness does involve. It's first and foremost a humble acceptance of our own wrongs. As I said before, that's the bit that, where our human pride is pricked because usually what we do is what most people on an alpha course do. They say, I'm not as bad as. We immediately do that carrot of comparison. So we have our own top 10 commandments, don't we? Three or four of them we'd all share, probably murder. I hope. But my six, seven, eight, nine, ten are, you know, I don't get too cross with people when they take my parking space, you know. That's the carrot of comparison, we're thinking, straight away as we think about this business of forgiveness, we're thinking, I'm not as bad as. Almost inevitably on most Alpha courses, when we talk about the love of God, the grace of God, the complete and perfect forgiveness of God, someone wants to say, well, will Hitler be in heaven? And I, of course, say it is highly unlikely. However, it is possible. If, if, in the very final moment of his life, he turned to Jesus. I can't imagine that, but there's lots of things I can't imagine. But either the cross works or the cross doesn't work. And if I want it to work for me, it has to work for everyone. Please don't hear me as saying, I hope anything disrespectful of the absolute horror and the givenness over to evil of some people. Please don't hear me not saying that. But mercy and grace either work completely or they don't work at all. The second thing is that forgiveness is actually to follow Jesus in practice. I mean, I can really talk a really good talk. You know that, don't you? I can put on a pretty good show. I've had 58 years of practice. But will I forgive those that hurt me? Will I actually even forgive myself? That's when being a follower of Jesus, the rubber hits the road. Christian forgiveness is not ignoring or forgetting 
bad things. I will always pray that people will be able to forget horror. Of course I do. But it isn't actually, forgive and forget is not a helpful thing to lay on yourself. God doesn't ask us to do it. God, if we're forgiving, is inviting us to give the situation to him. And he is the judge of all. Please hear my comments about who might be in heaven in that light. He is the judge of all. So if we forgive a hurt, a wrongdoing, we're not saying that something that's terrible has suddenly become okay. It is, as I say, choosing to give the situation or the person to God. This is the, the choice that is ours. It removes the power of that wrong thing over us. And it's life transforming. Some of us have done a thing called freedom in Christ as a course where there's the imagery of being caught on, a, on an angler's hook. Someone's cast a line and catches us on the hook. And we want to hold on to it so that the person knows how much they're hurting us. But of course, we're the only one who's on the hook. When we choose to forgive... And I do not underestimate how difficult this can be. My life has been blessed in a way that others' lives have not been blessed. But I can assure you, when we choose to forgive, we're not saying that something wrong and bad has suddenly become okay. We are putting the person or the situation into God's hands, and we're exercising a choice that has not been taken away from us by what has been done to us. This remains our choice to say into God's hands, to the cross you go. And it's life transforming personally and it's life transforming for a Christian community. And I, I'm not going to say, I hope this will come over in the right way. In hearing and praying for Ruth and Simon, I have been challenged myself to think about what are my accounts with others. We need to have very short accounts with others. Leonardo, we'll just put that summary up, Cheryl, if we may have that list just again so people can just see those things. And then let's just put up to finish the picture of the Last Supper. I don't know if you know that when Leonardo da Vinci was painting this famous picture and, and Judas is, is the one who's got his arm resting on the table just to the right of Jesus. He's holding a bag of money. When Leonardo da Vinci was painting this famous picture, he, uh, he was in dispute with a fellow painter. And he, this fellow painter was so much his enemy that he, he actually initially started off by painting the face of his enemy as Judas. So his retribution was going to be forever and ever that his enemy was going to be the face of Judas. But for months, he could not paint the face of Jesus. He could just not paint the face of Jesus. And then it suddenly came to him and he made his peace with his enemy and he was then able to paint Jesus' face. Forgiveness is crucial to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. On Remembrance Sunday... I think it's entirely right and appropriate that we give it some focus. My personal experience is that we can often need help with forgiving great trauma. And I just want to say that if you are the victim of domestic violence or you're the victim of abuse or you're the victim of any bullying or anything else, God is for you. 
God is with you. God loves you. And there are people in this church family who would want to stand alongside you and help you if the time is right to take yourself off some of those hooks and remove the power, some of the power, of what has been wrongly done to you. Find somebody that you trust to ask for help. Shall we stand together? Here's the final quote from Pete Gregg that I wanted just to give. Why he says this bit of the Lord's Prayer, this bit of prayer, yielding, saying yes to God, coming to the cross. And you might even want to just one more time have these bits of wood in your hand just as a physical reminder. Just feel the wood. Many of us have what are called holding crosses at home that we maybe have in our hands when we pray. But here's one that you can just use today. Pete says this, by surrendering to God, we overcome. By emptying ourselves, we are filled. And by yielding our lives in prayer, our lives themselves become a prayer.